yeah. All right, cool. All right, shit. Well, welcome everybody to episode 21 of 1 million of the Serial Chillers podcast. Things are going to go a little differently today. So, as you may have noticed, there was no intro. Holy shit. The intro, the intro will be back, and things aren't always going to be this way, but for this episode, we do have a change. It is hard in life sometimes to get guests to come into your studio and talk about serial killers with you. <laughs> so, unfortunately, for this episode, we didn't have enough guests to have a game show, but... With a slight alteration in the show's makeup anyway, it makes for a good introduction. So, from now on, every episode will include co-host slash producer Greg. Oh yeah, I forgot about it. We talked about that. Yeah, we did. I was like, did. what are you talking about? What's this new announcement? Yes. <laughs> so, uh, yes. he had a theme song. He will continue to carry it as a co-host and, quote-unquote, producer Greg. So... Uh, I'm. If you've listened to the show, you've heard Greg. Greg is uh, one of my best friends in the world, and we did a podcast before this, and it only felt proper to bring him into this with me. And uh, really, it just means I only have uh, half the amount of work I did yesterday. <laughs> uh, so, Greg, why don't you go ahead and stand up and tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, first day of school feeling. If you guys want to find Hella Greg, you can do it on Instagram at Hella Greg or SoundCloud.com slash Hella Greg. I want to give a huge shout out to two new Patreon supporters, uh, Kevin Wilson and NG Chris. Uh, Kevin oh. Wilson, I I got to see, I followed his link to a YouTube page. So he's, he, I don't know if it's he and his family, but they make pedals for guitars. It looks really rad. So uh, free plug, Kevin. Uh, I don't know how many people are listening, but uh, thank you for listening. And Chris, thank you so much. Uh, we play video games with you like every night, so I'll, I'll hand deliver your care package. So... Although we don't have a game show portion tonight, the game is, or excuse me, the show is still going to be the same in that each week we sit down with old friends, new friends, good friends, and bad friends and tell the story of an infamous serial killer. Throughout the show, Greg will chime in with uh, <laughs> on my story or have stories of his own that are true crime, dark, creepy, unsolved, or otherwise mysterious. So Greg brought the Menendez brothers, if I'm not mistaken. So we've got some yes. shit to go over today. So... No quizzes, and also, to that one dude who gave us the review about not having quizzes, check it out. You're fucking welcome, man. Yeah. <laughs> so, this is your yeah. If it doesn't fly. This, oh, one's, this one's for you, guy who gave us two stars. So, with, without further ado, let's do this, Greg. Welcome to the Serial Chillers Podcast. Oh, you forgot the... Oh, I get it. Yeah. What, let's play? Yeah. Because <laughs> there's no game. <laughs> I, know, I get it. Uh, I, I get it. I just. Yeah, it just doesn't feel right, huh? A little bit. Just do it. All right. Welcome to and let's play the Serial Chillers podcast. Jeez. Yes. All right. If you're gonna yell at me, uh, today's serial killer is the Rostov Reaper, Andre Chikatilo. This. <clears throat> this. You just sound scary. Uh, so I knew that there was a lot to this, and I knew that I was going to be biting off a lot going into this. If you knew anything about the Rostov Ripper, biting off going into this is not something you want to hear. So let's start with his early life. October 16th, almost happy birthday, 1936. Andrei, I wish him happy birthday. Andrei Chikatilo is born in Yablushnoy, Ukraine with water on the brain or hydrocephalus. At the time of his birth, Ukraine was in the grip of a mass famine caused by Stalin's forced collectivization of agriculture. Chikatilo's parents were both collective farm laborers who lived in a one-room hovel who received no wages for their work. What they did receive was the right to cultivate a plot of land for themselves behind their property. But to my understanding... They, they didn't have the resources to be able to cultivate that p plot of land behind their property. So they were able, they were given the right to it. That was the communism at work. And they <clears throat> didn't have the resources. We give you land. You must provide on seed. Yes. <laughs> that was exactly what it was. And they didn't have seed. So um, 
As a child, he was said to be so poor that he and his sister would eat leaves and grass for sustenance. Mm. They had uh, the distended bellies, like, you know, we see in the starving, you know, Ethiopian or African kids. It's culturally insensitive, dude. We were seeing that. <laughs> we were seeing this um, famine through Ukraine and Russia. Something at the time similar to what is happening there today. So, uh, 1941, at the age of five, his mother tells him about his brother Stefan, who was abducted and cannibalized by his neighbors who had been starving. Uh, there is no formal evidence of this taking place or really any evidence of Stefan ever existing. That doesn't mean that he didn't. It just means that it's kind of hard to prove. It would have happened in 1931, I think it would have been. Um, wh- what a thing to tell your five-year-old, no? Yeah, that's 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 pretty heavy. That's That's tough for anybody to have to deal with, but just drop it on a five-year-old who doesn't get to eat and then he hears his brother. Had been eaten? Food. Yeah, that's that's heavy, and and that little kid still has to live there, and you know, they, I'm assuming they don't live in a different place, so that means that he would still have those same neighbors. Anyway, ugh. <laughs> yeah, it would be weird if the guy still lived next door. You go outside to take the trash out, and he's just there. Yeah. So uh, in '42, Soviet w- is going to uh, enter World War II, and Chikatilo's father is drafted into the Red Army and subsequently taken prisoner after being wounded in combat. So a big thing that I noticed here was that the Russian army, if you were if you were caught in combat and you were taken as a prisoner, you were seen as a traitor. So even though he had been captured because he was injured during war, he was seen as a traitor. So even uh, you know, he would eventually come back. It, it, he didn't ever live the quality of life that like a veteran POW right. you, you would think would get. So um, between 41 and 44, Chikatilo witnessed some of the effects of Nazi occupation of Ukraine, which he described as, quote, horrors, adding he witnessed bombings, fires and shootings from which he and his mother would hide in cellars and ditches to survive. On one occasion, Chikatilo and his mother were forced to watch their own hovel burn to the ground. Uh, with his father at war, Chikatilo and his mother were sharing a single bed, and he was a chronic bedwetter and was berated and beaten by his mother for each offense. So, you know, part of the McDonald triad past the age of five. In 1943, yep. his mother gave birth to a daughter, Tatiana. If we remember correctly here, his father has been gone since 1941. The baby was born in 1943. Many people speculate that the only way she could have become pregnant was from being raped by a German soldier. If one were to take that assumption, they may also make the assumption that since his mother and he lived in a one-bedroom hovel and shared a bed, that he more than likely witnessed the German soldier rape his mother and conceive his sister. Yikes. So it's it's one of those stories, too, where uh, there's no 100 about it, but it... It is, it is mentioned in every single telling of the story. And I know it just does make it traumatic, and I don't know if that's why people add it, but I don't know if it's one of those things where it does, you know, have a little bit, like, we don't have the evidence, but he said this, and, you know, um, yeah. I'm not quite sure. <clears throat> but, yeah. um, in 44 to 48, we are looking at a uh, eight-year-old Chikatilo starting here. He was at the height, it was at the height of the famine, Uh, Like we said, his sister and he were eating leaves and grass. He would go to school in handmade clothes. And although he was a very smart student, he was very physically weak. He's a dweeb. Uh, This made him an easy target for bullying and the famine and his malnourishment led to a distended swollen belly and fainting spells both at home and school. In 48, at the age of 12, he eats bread for the first time. At the age of 12? At the age of 12. God, what is he, Henry Lee Lucas? That's well, that's the famine. I mean, like there, there was it was never at any point available to him. Even his mother, as you know, awful as she sounds, she, she, yeah. I don't think she had bread either. I don't think right. it was. No, a, I got you. Yeah. So in forty nine, so he's thirteen now. He would pray for his father to be back from war. Uh, his father's been gone for eight years in a POW for most of it. Uh, When his father finally does come back later that year, he is so sick with tuberculosis that he would just lay in bed hacking and spitting up blood and would just 
be in great pain, moaning. Oh. <laughs> So he hadn't had his dad in eight years, and when he finally came back, he was a traitorous coward who had tuberculosis. It, uh, Man, yeah, it's just that's what a life. What, what a life. It's not. It doesn't ever get better for him. So hang on. It doesn't ever get better for anybody around him really either. So, in 1950, he tried to be better than all of his classmates, seeming to have an affinity for being the teacher's pet. Uh, he had a weird knack for being able to remember long strings of numbers. Like people would just, the classmates or teachers would give him a long string of, you know, eight, seven, four, seven, three, four, six, one, six, four, three, three. And he would, re- you know, memorize these numbers. He knew pi out to like a hundred decimals or uh, it was kind of a, a weird thing. He uh, participated in literary and musical events and became the editor of the school's newspaper. It is said by now, in his teenage years, he is both a great student and an ardent communist. Uh, He is also chairman of the Pupils Communist Committee uh, two years after this, at 15. He is an avid reader of communist literature and was also delegated the task of organizing communist street marches. Although Chikatilo claimed learning did not come easy to him due to headaches and had poor memory, he was the only student from his uh, agriculture collective farm to complete the final year of study. So, I mean, he said it was hard for him. He has headaches. He has, he's fainting. He's only had bread for the last few years of his life. Yeah. Which is pretty crazy. And like, I, I sympathize with him on the whole, uh, got no memory. I got that, man. I got that. Well, he's got a great memory. He just, Oh, he ha- he finds it hard to learn. He says, yeah, that's the one. The C, C, C that's the one that I coming have. into play right there. You're just proving it. So, uh, in fifty, 50- no, I, I feel for him though. That's that's just a shit. That he's, he's just had a shit start. It's just been rough. And he's only fi- he's only fifteen right now. <sighs> so at sixteen, uh, he goes to work at a brick factory during the summertime. And while he's working at the brick factory, he has part of a brick wall fall on him and give him a head injury. Now this could be that the cause of that head injury that we. Another thing you look for in these killers is one of, I mean, it's not part of like the McDonald's triad, but it's a big thing. It's head injuries, dropped on the head, hit in the head by something. He has this giant wall fall on him. Um, At the onset of puberty, it says Chikatilo discovered that he suffered from chronic impotence, worsening his social awkwardness and self-hatred. He was shy in the company of women. So he was a late bloomer too. He didn't start hitting puberty until about 16. Um, His first crush at age 17 had been a girl named... Lilia Baryshiva, with whom he had become acquainted through the school newspaper. Uh, he was chronically nervous in her company, never asked for a date. He could never seal the deal. So uh, for all we know, Lilia Baryshiva could have stopped it all if he could have just told her how much he loved her. Sometimes you just got to get it out. Don't hold it in, guys. <laughs> you got somebody you got to tell, just fucking tell them. Just don't be weird and creepy about it. Or do, whatever. Not your boss. That's true. Uh, The same year, Chikatilo jumped on an 11-year-old friend of his younger sister and wrestled her to the ground. So I think initially it was innocent. You know, he was just kind of wrestling a friend. Uh, But as she started to wriggle away and uh, try to, you know, get away as they're kind of playing, he realized how much it kind of turned him on and... uh, for the first time in his life, he ejaculates in his pants with the girl in his grasp. Yikes. So That's a bad sign. It's the, it's starting now. So the next note I have, uh, it looks like I wanted to change the subject when I was putting this together. It says that he cried when Stalin died, one of the few times he said he would ever cry in his life. Uh, he wanted to go to Moscow and believed that communism would soon conquer the world. Uh, that summer... This is the following summer from the brick falling on him. Uh, he was working on the farm, and a horse-drawn rake for harvesting uh, also fell on him and gave him another head injury. Yeesh. So we're talking to, I'm guessing, major head injuries. It didn't really get into a lot of details on most of the uh, places I looked for the info, but if you're going to mention it twice, it seems like... They're probably they were probably significant in a way. 
Yeah. Uh, in 1954, he finishes the 10th grade. He applies for Moscow. It uh, works differently. We don't, they don't have 12th grades in Russia. I was very confused at first, too. Uh, he applies for Moscow University to study law and uh, failed his in- entry exam and wasn't accepted into the university. Now, from what I understand, he did not fail his entry exam. He uh, Actually, I wrote it here. He was convinced that he did not get in because of his father's war record. So, remember, his dad was seen as a traitor. Uh, the right. truth was that other students had simply outperformed him in a highly competitive exam. So he did well on the exam. Uh, from all for all intents and purposes, he had a very great score. It just wasn't good enough. There was oh. other guys who did better. Um, he did not out. attempt to enroll in any other schools. Instead, he traveled to the city of Kursk, where he worked as a laborer for three months before, in 1955, enrolling in vocational school, where he studied to become a communications technician. Uh, the same year, Chikatilo formed his first serious relationship with a local girl who three years his junior. Um, so three years younger than him, and I believe at the time now he's 18. Uh, the, on three separate occasions, the couple attempted intercourse, although on each occasion Chikatilo was unable to sustain an erection. After 18 months, the girl broke off the relationship. So she gave it a go. She gave it the old call. College try. 18 months. That feels like she she tried. Uh, Chikatilo performed his compulsory military service between 57 and 60. So at the time, if you were a, a Russian male, you you did four years in the army. And he did it, 57 to 60. He was assigned first to serve with border guards in Central Asia, Asia then to a KGB communications unit in Berlin. Here, his work record was unblemished, and he joined the Communist Party in 1960, shortly before his military service ended. Upon completing his army service, Chikatilo returned to his native village to live with his parents. He soon became acquainted with a young divorcee, and the pair began a three-month relationship, which ended after several unsuccessful attempts at intercourse. When the woman innocently asked her friends for advice as to how Chikatilo might overcome his inability to maintain an erection, it blew up. So... Uh, from what from what I can gather, people were very she she was very serious. Like she asked one friend, like what do I do? Like she thought she might be doing something wrong. Like was it looking for a tip? Like how do I get him? How do I get his dick hard? And right. that friend was like, what? He can't get his dick hard? And told everybody. And essentially, it blows up. He 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 leaves town. Nice. So uh, he, that's that's the way to drive drive somebody out of town. Is- <clears throat> call their manhood into question. Yeah, exactly. It says, as a result, most of his peers discovered his impotence. And in 1993 interview regarding this incident, Chikatilo stated, girls were going behind my back, whispering that I was impotent. I was so ashamed. I tried to hang myself. My mother and some young neighbors pulled me out of the news. Well, I thought no one would want such a shamed man. So I had to run away from there, away from my homeland. So he's he's feeling the uh, he's feeling the, does, the you're right. It doesn't get any easier for, easier for him. Mm-hmm. In fact, it seems like it gets much much harder. So he's 24 years old now, and after several months, Chikatilo finds a job as a communications engineer in a town located north of Rostov on Don. He located mm-hmm. uh, relocated to Russia in '61, renting a small apartment close to his workplace. The same year, his younger sister, Tatiana, finished her schooling and moved into his apartment. Tatiana lived with her brother for six months before marrying a local youth and moving to her in-law's home, as is with tradition. At 27, he meets and marries his wife, his wife, Feodosia. That's right, a wife. Uh, Feodosia is three years younger than him. His sister sets him up with Feodosia because she really wants him to start a family. So essentially, Tatiana says, listen, I got this friend Feodosia. She doesn't really care about the no dick thing. And, uh, you know, Fe- the, what, from what I understand, Feodosia was really happy with the fact that, one, uh, Chikatilo didn't just um, drink vodka and kick her damn ass, which also was with tradition in 1963 Orosha. Right. Um, and that's that's I'm not even really making a joke there. That was one of the points that most articles had to make was that he didn't drink. And that was also seen as kind of like an insult was that people would, hey, we're going out for drinks after work. And he's just like. No. Yeah, he was like, no, nah, I'm good. I am not drinking tonight. <laughs> so Feodosia, aware of his uh, issues. um 
doesn't didn't really seem to mind because it was you know she was getting a good home life out of it. So two years later in 1965, for 500 points, Greg, what do you think happened? Say he, he uh, raped somebody. In 1965, at 29, the impotent Andre Chikatilo has his first child, Leo <clears throat> So Well, damn it. Um, I mean, I guess I'm glad he didn't rape anybody in 1965. But. Yeah, from, I guess, it was just a... Uh, it's just a scooping thing. That's really how it worked. Uh, there wasn't a lot of a lot he could do. So good for him for you know he, it's communism. They just came by and they were like, "Here, you have child now." <laughs> he took from family that had three. In in sixty nine, he's thirty three. He has his second and last child, a son named Yuri. So uh, he's got Yuri and let me let me really white these up for you. Uh, Yuri and Lyodmia. L Y U D M I L L A. That's his Lyodmila. Lyodmila. Hmm. I wonder if that's what Mila Kunis' name is. Lyodmila. Uh, I do not know. Yeah, that's anyway. an interesting theory. We'll have to look into that. So in 1971, yep. he's now 35 years old. He enrolls in the Rostov Liberal Arts University. He gets a degree in literature and theology. And when he graduated, becomes a teacher. Hey, good for him, right? You know, if you're going to do something, why not shape the minds of the next generation? That is what I am talking about, Greg. So, in... 1973, two years later, he is very comfortable in his teaching position and tries to rape Anna, one of his students. He asked her to stay after school and then continued to beat her with a ruler, all while getting aroused and ejaculating in his pants. Yes. So, I mean, it's becoming pretty clear, I think, that he knows and understands that the struggle is what's going to get it done for him. This is the only thing that's going to beat the impotence is when he can uh, be in control and they can fight. And it's too hard for him to go home to his wife and say, hey, pretend like you don't like this. You know, I, that's, I, I like that you said that because the base research I did for this, and I, I like to use them because they're very, very, very well researched. So the base research I used for this was the last podcast in the left episode. And I believe Henry Zabowski brings that up. And Marcus said, like, we're talking 1964 Soviet Russia. Like, this isn't exactly the place where you tell your wife you're into weird, kinky, rough shit. But, I mean, case yeah, in point, but... I believe Ben said, so you just have to rape and murder her so you don't have to say that to your wife? So that's kind of the... Well, I mean, there's that, but there's also, like... I feel like probably in 1963 Russia, you don't have to ask. You just yeah, that's maybe true. Maybe maybe he did. I mean, there's just no note of it. So he does this to Anna. Oh, excuse me. In 1973, and then in January of 74, nine months later, he is let go from his teaching job. That's quote unquote let go. What? So why? Since it is communist Russia, uh. If one teacher did something that was going to be a detriment to all the teachers, they're going to be punished as a whole. Oh, oh bummer. Corporal punishment? Yeah. So uh, instead of reporting him, they would just go ahead and uh, let it slide. And if it got too bad, they'd tell him, hey, uh, you're going to have to quit. Like, that's just really all there is to it. Or, you know, you're going to have to quit. And so that's that's what happens. Uh, he gets let go from his teaching job. In September of 78, four years later, he's teaching uh, at another school and gets laid off again. He finds a new job as a warden at a school. Um, I did not know schools had wardens. I looked into this as well, and it seems like it's more of a, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a guidance counselor position. Mm. Yeah, different terminology. You know, in the UK, they call silverware cutlery. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, 
he gets laid off from I one, disagree. Another, I just disagree another school and he becomes a warden at a new school. Uh, if somebody knows a little more about uh, Russian schools, please, I'm, I'm very curious to know about this. Uh, in April of 78, uh, Chikatilo moves to Shakti, a coal mining town near Rostov on Don, where he's currently living. Uh, he's going to commit his first documented murder here. On December 22nd, Chikatilo lured a nine year old girl named Yelena Zakatanova to an old house which he had secretly purchased. So, this house, he. There are two reports. One says that he secretly purchased this house, another says that he bought the house under the guise of it being his father's to retire to. Okay. So so he, he bought it with, uh, under false pretenses? I'm not sure which one is real, if he bought it secretly or bought it under the false pretenses. But either way, he's got a secret shack, a secret little hovel. Secret, secret murder hut is what it sounds like? Yeah, it sounds like a secret murder hut. So he attempted to rape her but failed to achieve an erection. When the girl struggled, he choked her and stabbed her three times in the abdomen, ejaculating while stabbing the child. Her body was found two days later in the Groshkeva River. Numerous pieces of evidence linked Chikatilo to Zakatanova's murder. Spots of blood had been found in the snow near the house Chikatilo had purchased. Neighbors had noted that Chikatilo had been present in the house on the evening of December 22nd. Zakatanova's school rucks shack had been found upon the opposite bank of the river on the end of the street, indicating the girl had been thrown into the river at this location, and a witness had given a police a detailed description of a man closely resembling Chikatilo, whom she had been talking with. Zakatanova... Oh, who had been talking with Zakatanova at the bus stop. Um, mm-hmm. The last place she's seen alive. Despite these facts, a 25-year-old laborer named Alexander Kravchenko, who as a teenager had served prison sentence for the rape and murder of a teenage girl, uh, was arrested for the crime. Uh, a search of Kravchenko's home revealed spots of blood on his wife's jumper. The blood type was determined to match both Zakatanova and Kravchenko's wife. Um, Kravchenko had a watertight alibi for the afternoon of December 22nd. He had been at home with his wife and a friend of hers the entire afternoon, and the neighbors of the couple were also able to verify this. Nonetheless, the police, having threatened Kravchenko's wife with being an accomplice to the murder, had she and her, oh, and to charge she and her friend with perjury, obtained a new statement in which the women claimed Kravchenko had not returned home until much later in the evening that day of the murder. Confronted with these altered testimonies, Kravchenko confessed to the killing. He was tried for the murder in 1979. And at his trial, Kravchenko retracted his confession and maintained his innocence, stating his confession had been obtained under extreme duress. Mm. Despite, they tortured me until I said, yes, it was me. All right. Despite his retraction, he was only convicted of murder and sentenced to death in 1979. So there is a little bit of a difference here. So the sentence was actually the death sentence was commuted to 15 years imprisonment, which is the maximum possible length of imprisonment in Russia at the time. Uh, by the Supreme Court uh, set in December of 1980. Under pressure from the victim's relatives, Kravchenko was re- was retried and eventually executed for Zakatanova's murder in July of 1983. So in Russia, you can not only appeal a... You know, like the defense... You, you can... Def- he was given a 15-year sentence... And the family of the defendant, of the victim, said, no, like, we want to appeal that, and we think he's going to do worse. So he, they did. They retried him, and they gave him the death sentence. Mm. Take yeah. that. Yeah. So um, probably not the guy that killed her. Uh, definitely, It's definitely not. I'll, spoiler alert. It is not the guy that <laughs> killed the little girl. It was definitely Andre. Surprise. Chikilo, yes. Um, uh, man, man pretty brutal so innocent guy is is killed for that following uh zach Tanova's murder chikatilo was able to achieve sexual arousal and orgasm only through stabbing and slashing women and children to death so that was another thing i, I kind of missed was when he stabbed zach Tanova, he realized blood blood was the way it's the first time in his life he ever achieved an erection was at the side. Uh, was at the side of blood. I mean, 
wanting sex makes you do crazy things apparently. And that's, 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 that's crazy. Yeah. So, um, first time he's achieving arousal, he has the orgasm. Um, although he does stress that initially, um, he, he tried to resist the urges and he, he couldn't, they overcame him. Yeah. So, September 3rd, 1981, uh, we're going to, you know what? We're going to jump to a murder. Let's take a little break here, actually. Um, okay. We'll come back. We'll, we'll talk about your story, and then it's just going to go fucking crazy downhill with uh, Chickatillo after that. So we'll, we're going to take a break right now, come back, hear Greg's take on the Menendez brothers, uh, take a little break from the Ukrainian-Russian uh, ripper of Rostov. Uh, mm-hmm. Come back or we'll kill you. Yes. Hey, this is Sarah, Sam and Casey from Just Another Murder Podcast. We are three Aussie ladies chatting about murder and making funny jokes. Oh, more no, like bad more jokes. Like inappropriate <laughs> jokes. Sorry. Go listen to us wherever you listen to podcasts. You can find us on Insta, Twitter and Facebook. Okay. Bye. 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 See ya. Bye. Bye. All right. Well, welcome back, everybody, to the Serial Chillers podcast with Jesse and Greg. We, uh, Greg's got a story. It's one that we've all know and love. I'm sure if you're of the true crime uh, family, <coughs> you have heard this. I think they are making a new Law and Order true crime special about it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Take it away, Greg. Uh, okay. Thanks. Hi. Um, hey. Today, I bring you the story of Lyle and Eric Menendez. They were uh, some really swell guys who were born to an affluent family. And the family was really good to them. And they turned out to be productive members of society. The end. Their dad Mm -hmm. managed Menudo. Yeah. Well, yeah. Not the gross suit. Um, Oh. (laughs) I almost would have preferred it. (laughs) Um, So... Joseph Lyle Menendez and Eric Galen Menendez um, were brothers. They were born two years apart. Um, Joseph, or I'm sorry, Lyle Menendez, as he went by, was born January 10th, 1968. Um, Eric Menendez, born November 27th, 1970. And they were born in uh, Beverly Hills. They were born to an affluent family um it's crazy because i still think of them as young and those are the birth years of my parents yeah exactly i mean they they're only what 49 and 47 right now yeah 46 yeah in that range yeah um so their parents jose and kitty menendez um kitty was a stay-at-home mom she didn't do a whole lot she attended um PTA meetings. Apparently she was really disheveled most of the time. Um, Jose Menendez, on the other hand, worked his way up for, through a series of uh, record companies and production agencies and was making, you know, big time bucks. Big time bucks. And apparently he was a rather cutthroat kind of guy. I think you have to be. <clears throat> well, yeah, to be in that industry, I would agree. But, like, usually there's, like, a An separated... Off switch. You know what I mean? Like leave the leave the work at work and bring you know bring the love home. Yeah. And and apparently he was just a cutthroat guy all the time. I mean, like, like you, I also uh, am a fan of Last Podcast on the Left, and listen to their Menendez Brothers thing. I mean, I it's this is information that I just kind of had rolling around in my head, so I listened listen to them to tighten up, and I'm like, yeah, all right, I remember a lot of this, and remember hearing hearing stories and he was just like their dad was just like the last podcast guys were talking about how he would go out on the tennis court when he was forcing his son to go to tennis practice he would go out there and he would scream at the coach this is you're gonna teach him this way instead and the coach is like look dude you paid me all this money to do it and he's like yeah and i'm paying you all this money to do it the way i want it done now do it lavar ball (laughs) Ooh, could the ball brothers be the new menendez brothers only time will tell well, you know, <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's just the kind of guy he was. He was a real cutthroat kind of guy. And, and in turn, because he was so rough on his kids, I mean, 
I don't know if it's entirely because he was so rough on his kids, but I'm sure it didn't help. Um, they turned out to be pieces of shit. What? Yeah, go figure. Um, no way, Jose. Uh, it, no, it, it, yes way, and it was Jose. Hmm. Um, and so these guys, I mean, they weren't, they were sociopaths. They weren't like your classic, like, used to kill pets and you know like they they weren't dommers they were more like bundies if you will where they put on they put on the front like everything was good and everything was groovy and really everything inside really wasn't groovy bundy was pretty calm cool and collected yeah and these guys tried to be um it was they just weren't they weren't bright um, they would, they got caught with, uh, caught up in a, in a burglary where they stole some money from a friend and, um, effectively the younger brother, uh, Eric took the fall. He, he basically took the fall because Lyle was supposed to be the next one in line for the family. So like when Jose quit bringing in the bucks that was it was lyle who had to be the one who had to bring in the bucks you know what i mean he was gonna he was the heir to the menendez fortune and so like eric when when they got caught stealing this money from their friend eric had to take the fall because they didn't want any marks on lyle's record um which is kind of shitty what is it like some kingship over there at the menendez house apparently Huh. And it, it, it could be a cultural thing. It could be just a perception thing. It could be any number of things, but that just seems like a like an awkward way to get things done. Or maybe you know? just a little brother being a bro. Well, and it's like, why not hedge your bet? Why put all your uh, eggs in the in the Lyle basket? Why do they? Why, yeah. why does it have to be the older kid? Right. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. So. Um, you know, so that happened. So Eric has this mark on his record for, for theft and all this. And, um, anyway, they basically the whole of chain of events was set in motion because, um, they were fucking up. They were fucking up fast and picking up steam and the dad had had enough of it. And he was like, that's it. I'm cutting you guys off, which cutting them off meant instead of, Seven figures a year. They're only getting six figures a year. Oh, no. I know. I mean, <laughs> at the ages of, what, 18 and 21? Right. Like, how hard, like, what are you going to do with seven figures a year? Straight chill, homie. Uh, no, apparently the answer to that is uh, buy shotguns and murder time. your oh. fucking parents' face off. Oh, yeah, that was different uh, than what I was thinking. In the most literal sense. Yeah, shit. Yeah. Got real fast. Yeah. So. Also over here still trying to quote office space. <laughs> Night eating and then a job. So on August 20th, 1989, Lyle and Eric were 21 and 18 respectively. Uh, the murders that occurred that evening in the den of the family's home in Beverly Hills. Uh, Jose and Kitty were tired and they were basically kicking it at home. They didn't decide. They decided not to go out. They're not going to go do anything. They were watching a James Bond movie. Ooh, um, one? the, well, neighbors reported hearing loud bangs around 10 and pretty much was like, eh, it's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. Cause you know, when do you not hear loud bangs in a nice ne- Beverly Hills neighborhood? That's what I was just going to say, wait in Beverly <clears throat> Hills. Why would they say, don't worry about it? Yeah. Seems silly. Um, they thought kids were playing with firecrackers basically, could, but I get, I could see that you got a bunch of spoiled kids in the neighborhood. They're just going to do whatever they want. Uh, cops are. Cops are paid to make sure that you're right or wrong. You know, yeah. just let, hey, let them check well, it out. Right there with you. All right, anyway. I just, so, yeah. That, that's neither here nor there. That's up right. to the decision of the neighbors uh, who were, I, I guess, I'm guessing at uh, 724 North Elm Drive because these guys were at 722. Ah. So, um, you know, if you're ever in Beverly Hills, go to 722 North Elm Drive and see the Menendez house. I've actually seen this. I've actually seen the house. I've driven by it. Yeah. Was it spooky? Uh, no, not at all. All right. Bummer. Yep. Um, so basically Jose 
was shot point blank in the back of the head with a Mossberg 12 gauge shotgun. Jesus. Fuck. Yeah. I, if you're not a gun person, you might not know, but shotguns do damage. Yeah. They, especially it, at close range. It spreads. Yeah. So it leaves a big entry wound, but it leaves a bigger exit wound. Yeah. Like a much bigger exit wound. It it's the gun that turns you to hamburger meat. Yeah. Um Kitty, awakened by the shots, got up from the couch, ran for the hallway, and was shot in the leg. Slipped in her own blood and fell. She was then shot several times in the arm, chest, and face, leaving her unrecognizable. So, so they winged their mom. <clears throat> she yeah. went down and one of them went over there and had to finish her off. Yeah, and my guess is because from some of the research, it seemed like Lyle was more the ringleader. It seemed like he was more or less calling the shots. Like, when it came time to do this, he told Eric, it's go time. So, you know, so they, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I, I This doesn't have a whole lot to do with a, a lot of it. Didn't one of them have like um maybe alopecia or some type of hair disorder where like one of them was like losing their hair at a very yeah, young he age. Was, he was, um, I, I believe it was Lyle. And okay. he, was, he was losing his hair at a pretty good clip, but he, he didn't have alopecia. Okay. Okay. He, he wasn't completely bald. He was just, his hair was just falling out. It at was like just, 18. Yeah. Okay. I see. It started when he was real young, like 18, 19. And okay. he was, he was thinning. And I believe when they were on trial, he was wearing a toupee. At you know, that's what I remember 22, hearing. Okay. Yeah, all right. Yeah, it all makes sense now. Um, so yeah, the 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 thinking is that because Eric didn't necessarily really want to get involved, he only went over when he thought the mom was dead and shot her, and huh. she wasn't dead until he shot her. So uh, he yeah, he unwillingly did the kill shots. <clears throat> And then because there was a lot of speculation about Jose being involved in uh, organized crime just because of the business that he's in, you know, right. um, <clears throat> the entertainment business is fairly easy to launder money through from what I've heard. Not that I've ever done anything like that. Right. Looking at Greg's background. Um, <laughs> you don't look into Greg's background. Um because I've never taken part in anything like that, I can't speak for certain, but it seems like it would be fairly easy to launder money through that. The only other things that would be easier than that would be like a laundromat or a casino. Or apparently a car wash. Or a car wash. Huh? Yeah, cash-based businesses, basically. But even though the entertainment's not entertainment business isn't cash-based, there's a lot of booking gigs and there's a lot of um, money-changing hands for various things, and it's easy to tuck stuff away in the books. Uh, CEOs of industries like that do it all the time. Look into it. Um. Greg's Conspiracy Corner, coming in November. Oh, God, really? Okay. <clears throat> I'll get some shit together. Um, but because they were in the... Uh, because they, there was rumors that he, would, they, he was involved in organized crime, uh, the brothers then decided it would be a good idea to uh, kneecap their already deceased parents. So they took the shotguns and uh, shot their parents point blank in the kneecaps um, to make it look like a mob hit. <sighs> now... Um, Again, having never been in the mob, I could not tell you how they do actually do it. Um, so that's just I probably something like, they picked up from movies or something like, hey, in the movies, they kneecap them. Like, all right, we for sure got to do that. Well, the, yeah, see, there's that because that would always seem like more of sending a message. Like it was, you would shoot them in the kneecaps and then be like, now here's your, that was your last chance, right. you know? You know, go tell them what you saw or whatever. You're yeah. sending a message. You're not going to shoot somebody in the kneecaps and then kill them because that's just a waste of ammo. Exactly. Um, anyway, so they went out. The, then the brothers left, cleaned themselves up and left. They went to the pool house. They showered. They changed clothes. They split. Um, they went to the movies. And then they came back. When they came back, they called 911, and if you listen to the tape, you can hear one of the boys screaming, you know, somebody killed my parents. And it's, 
it sounds over rehearsed. It like sounds practiced quite a bit. Yeah, it sounds like they really had to talk about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Do um, you want to hear the nine one? I can play the nine one one call if you want. Please, please do because it'll make a better point than I can. What's the problem? What's the problem? What's the problem? I'm sorry, kill my parents. Pardon me? I was going to say, that, that that pretty much right there, though. Okay, that kind of sums he, up what you're... It did sound yeah, very... He, uh, a little yeah. forced. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He calls 911. He, I mean, he has the presence of mind to call 911, but then he can't collect himself. I mean, yeah, it just seems, it seems strange. I don't know if that... I mean, I don't know that I'd be able to blame someone for having the presence of mind to call 911 but not collect himself. But I, I definitely feel a forced delivery like he did it four or five times before he called and then yeah, was, and, and then was the like the other right. one's sitting there going no no no, no, no. Right, dial yeah, it back yeah, dial yeah, it back here we go what so <clears throat> if he if he can't collect himself why not hand the phone off there's another brother there right you know 50 percent of your hit squad's still in the house why not make him talk to the cops yeah so um basically the police considered the brothers to be suspects, but they didn't have any evidence. They didn't order the brothers to undergo gunshot residue tests when they learned that they re- recently used a firearm. Why not just do it? Um, yeah, I mean, during the trial, Eric said he spotted a shotgun shell that they'd left on the floor and removed it while the policeman who was talking to him looked away. Oh. Really? I mean... <sighs> yeah, I don't like to disparage police, but... Hey... If you missed, you missed. Straight yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. Like, <clears throat> you just missed. That's what that is. So, apparently, they had there the security there was pretty good. They had a um, Mediterranean mansion, and it was rented previously to musicians like Prince, Elton John. Um, apparently, Jose frequently left the alarm system off, and the gates open. Um, the gates are gone now. Yeah, oh, well... Apparently they weren't doing any good anyway. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so these guys, these guys murdered the shit out of their parents um, yeah. in cold blood. Pretty crazy. Yeah, and it was what was strange was there was a lot of family members coming to their defense, saying no, they couldn't have done it. They couldn't have done it. And speculation on that is because. If these boys had killed their parents, the money goes to probate and this vast fortune that Jose and Kitty Menendez had would never see the light of day. And so these people are in it for their own benefit. So they're using the murder of somebody else to try and benefit themselves. Murder of a family member? Well, I mean, I guess they're looking at it like, well, I put the murder of my brother away and I get nothing or I say let the killers of my brother go free and by I, I my testimony my share of and the I fortune. get paid hmm. possibly yeah <sighs> murka huh you know what I'm so saying? um just you know in case you were wondering uh they are both currently incarcerated um, just fun fact they're at uh, Mule Creek State Prison and uh, Richard J. Donovan Correctional Facility so uh, if you want to write to them <laughs> those you know, let them know the, what pieces the of shit they are facilities in which to do it yeah well fucking love that story I mean I don't love that story but I mean like it's such a like and, and, uh, I tried not to give too much of it away because there's a lot there's a lot there about like um, there's rumors about Jose being uh, sexually aggressive towards the boys as they were when they were kids or and like, stuff like molesting that. and raping right and and that was one of the things I was gonna bring up is that some of the family members were like yep that was happening I could I could tell I don't know why I didn't say anything but like yep that was totally happening that so it was like a little more than them even agreeing that you know. Um, Oh, the boys couldn't have done it. Like, there's just no way. Like, they they uh they were saying like, oh no no no, like he was, 
he was fingering them. Yeah, see, and it's like that. I I want people to read to do their own homework. Yeah, like that. That's no, kind of why I like doing the intermediate yeah. stories on your show and not like the, not the, the not the full blown ones. thing yeah. because it's it's nice because it, it, I try to give people enough to be interested and still want to go and do their own homework and draw their own conclusion about what actually happened. Right. And may I remind you that you like to do the intermediate stories on our show. So just, just, just remember that. All right. Just try to try to keep that in mind. Well, then I guess we'll get back to Andre Chiquitillo. Uh, Thank you, Greg. That was wonderful. Uh, as always, the crowd appreciates a hella Greg moment or producer Greg. You, you guys choose, okay? I've been so, called worse. Yeah, I have worse. Just see what your next story's like. Um, <laughs> so uh, he he has the murder of Zektanova, the nine-year-old girl. Uh, Kravchenko is executed for that crime uh also at this time in russia the uh, execution process is a bullet behind the right ear perfect so it makes sense there you go so this is going to be one of really the only um extended cool down periods that we're going to see for him at all because at some points he just gets going like just going so you know as you know with most serial killers there's some sort of um cool down period there's a a first murder and then a you know maybe a little extra thought or a little like holy shit am i gonna get away with this maybe i just don't for a while and i'll be normal that's uh this is this is the time where we're gonna see andre do that but it's the only time so uh we go from 79 to 81 so almost two full years he takes off so and and if you'll also notice too we get a very late start he's that's four, a big jump he's 43 at the time of his first murder and his first arousal so moving on that's tortured soul tortured soul yeah, poor guy yeah i don't know i mean i i, I don't I, I don't it's un, it's unfathomable you know what i mean like you can't yeah. put yourself in in those sh- i mean like uh, never mind i'm not even gonna go there uh yeah <laughs> so september 3rd 1981 now at 45 years old uh he 17 year old larisa tachenko tachenko yeah man i'm sorry everybody <laughs> Uh, he took her out into a forested area, fills her mouth with dirt, strangles her for a while, uh, finally kills her, ejaculates in his pants, and like I said earlier, as a bad bad pun, uh, bites off her nipple. So I said I bit off more than I could chew for this episode. Well, Andre Chikatilo's one of his favorite things to do was with his mouth, remove certain body parts. And, uh, he, he says that he never ate them, but he did like to chew on them. How they were, I think he said like pink and bouncy. Oh God. Good grief. Charlie Brown. I just can't even really bad. So, uh, six months later, we're looking at June of 82. He's 46 years old, 13 year old. Layuba Biryuk was stabbed repeatedly and wounded. Um, Her eyes were gouged out. She was killed, and then he raped the corpse and threw her into the woods and just covered her up with some leaves and brush. So what we're about to go on right now is going to be dates and murders. I'm not going to go into crazy detail on any of these as I don't really like to. This is honestly, I, I like to skip over chunks, but this time just to show the sheer vast streak that we're talking about here i'm i'm pretty much going to go down the list and give you give you the run through okay just the the thick and veiny of it the, yeah i guess we can call it that so we're going to go from june of 82 to 
July of 82, where Layuba Volobuyeva, who was 14, was savagely killed during Chikatilo's business trip to the southern region of Krasnodar. Uh, in August of 82, less than one month later, Oleg Pozdiev, who was nine, was brutally murdered on another business trip of Chikatilo's. August 16th of 82, Olya Kuprina, who was 16, was brutally murdered back in Rostov. On September 82, uh, just a month later, Ida Kara Belikanova and Sergei Kuzmin, uh, within nine days and one mile of each other, were found stabbed to death. On December 11th, also still in 1982, Olya Stalmacheknok, who was 10, was found brutally tortured and murdered. Uh, she was seven years old. In June of 83, so we got a little six-month break here, uh, Laura Sar uh, Sarkisian, uh, who was 15, was murdered, but the body was never found. Police learned of this case through Chikatilo's confessions. July of 83, the next month, Ira Dunenkova, who was 13, this is brutal, was found stabbed to death in Aviators Park. This murder stands out because he knew her and she had been to his house. So uh, this was um, a sex worker, getting I believe. A little, getting a little too close to home there. Well, uh, I think it was a sex worker that he had taken to the murder shack, to be perfectly honest. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, also in July of 83, Layuda Kutztyuba, who was 24, uh, a transient, was killed near a small railway stop just outside Shakti. She wasn't found until nine months after her murder. So, speaking of the railway, this is kind of the thing is, uh, at this time, he is working for the Communist Party. He goes around and essentially collects the promises of the, um, you know, to quote last podcast again, they, they gave an example of, you know, the way they made things was, okay, we make the screws for this in this town and we make the, the bolts in this town and we make these parts in this town. Yeah. So, uh, Andre Chikatilo's job was to go around and essentially get the promises like, Oh, you're going to deliver uh, 15 tons of concrete by next month. Like I'm here to make sure you, you make good on that promise. Like, that's the delivery? Good. All right. And then he goes on to the next town. So he's always traveling. He's always moving around. He's got a pretty steady job. He And uh, he was very good at working the system, they said. So where most people got, like, one-bedroom apartments, he had, like, a four-bedroom house. And he had nicer cars. And he knew how to work the communist system. And, you know, understandably so. We're talking about him being 10 or 11 years old, being very into communist literature. So he is very... Just a man of the state from the get-go. From childhood. Okay, so in August of 83, Igor Gudkov, who was seven, was found slaughtered, also in Aviators Park, and Valia Chucholina, who was 22, was brutally stabbed in the late summer. Uh, October 27th, 1983, Vera Shevkun, who was 19, was a sex worker killed on the edge of Shakti. Uh... December 27th, 1983, Sergei Markov, who was a 14-year-old schoolboy, was murdered on a piece of wasteland about a mile north of the nearby town of Noverherskax. Jesus. Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just not even close. <laughs> You know what it makes me think of? What's that? The, the video of that kid who was running and trying to jump the hurdles and just kept hitting every hurdle and falling. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's, and it's, I mean, he just, the poor about, son of a bitch kept running. And you just keep running, and I got to admire you for it, but I would have, so I would have just given up on names. On January 10th, 1984, Natalia Shalababina. <laughs> no, she's Italian now. <laughs> uh, ooh, uh, she's 17, the tramp and an alcoholic, murdered in Aviators Park as well. She was found in unrecognizable condition. Her body was covered in stab wounds and nose and upper lip had been cut or bit off as had one of the fingers on her left hand <sighs> February 22nd 1984 formal charges were made against Chikatilo for theft of state property um, it was suggested in no uncertain terms to him that it would be a good idea if he found himself a new job so I think if I'm not mistaken it was like it was linoleum like he stole some linoleum I'm sorry you cut out he stole some linoleum 
He stole linoleum. Yep, that was his. That was what he the the formal charges that were put against him were for. Dude while while get, out get doing collecting his industrial promises, he said, "You know, I could use 400 square foot of new linoleum for the kitchen," and took it. And formal charges were made against him, and it was suggested that he find a new job. Uh, on the very same day, Marta Ryabakenko, who was 44, was found brutally murdered. She was seeking. Um, I, well, I put this in quotes here because the article said that. Myra Rybovikanko was, quote, seeking oblivion in sex and alcohol. Aren't we all, though? What the fuck? I mean, what, what article? What? How did they know? <laughs> I mean, who the hell are you to judge? <clears throat> right. Um, I'll, I will put that article in my sources because I did use it for other things. Um, I won't tell you which one it is since I just bashed it. On December 27, 1984, police arrest a man not far from the scene of a crime who is slightly uh, mentally disabled. He was charged with the two killings and confessed, but later withdrew his claim, insisting that he had been obtained under or the confession had been obtained under duress. But it was too late. He was already in jail. Later on, killed by a firing squad. That is two people who have been killed for Chickatillo crimes. On March 27th, 1984, uh, there is no first name that I found. Just the last name, Pashtinko, who is 10, was found stabbed to death with over 54 stab wounds. Escalation is happening right now. Yeah. Have you noticed that? Things are getting a lot more brutal, a lot more sloppy. Um, in May of 84, Tanya Petrosian, an ex of his, uh, this is one of the women we talked about before uh, that uh, told a, that left him because of his impotence. Right. Uh, he runs into her randomly. Hey, what the hell? And says like, "Hey, let's go on a picnic." And she has her little daughter Sveta, um, Tanya, and Andre and Sveta go out to like this area and lay a blanket down and start having a picnic. And apparently, Tanya and Andre start getting a little frisky, and the kid apparently gets the idea and starts to wander off. So um, he's trying, and he he. He, she's not struggling hard enough for something because he cannot get it up. So Tanya mocks Chikatilo when he can't get the erection. And I believe she said something like, you call yourself a man. And he takes out this gigantic, like, kitchen knife. You know, think like yeah, 10-inch bread knife. And <laughs> stabs it through the right side of her head. Now, everything I'm giving you is Chikatilo's accounts. However... Most of what he's saying by like the bodies and everything is corroborated. He's it was pretty yeah. fucked. So, anyways, he plunges it deep into the left side of her head from his right side, and then begins going at it uh, on her skull with a hammer. Um, he gads, man. Yeah, Sveta, See, the young so daughter. He, so he, you're saying he's in full rampage mode now, like mad rampage mode, mode because he's he needs the blood. And so he's naked, too. He's taking it all off. The blood turns him on. So he's already trying to have sex with her. So he was partially unclothed. And when the blood started coming, he became fully naked, covered in her blood. Sveta comes back around the corner. And they lock eyes. And he just takes off sprinting after her with the hammer. Jumps on her. Holds her down. Beats her head in with the hammer. And then comes back with the knife and severs her head. And it was found 15 feet from her body. Good grief. Yeah. Good grief. So um, in June, just about a month later, uh, Yelena Bakulina, who is 22, and Anna Lemesheva and Dima Ilanurov were all found murdered in that one-and-a-half-month period there. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Fidozia's, uh, Fidozia, Chikatilo's wife, makes him seek psychiatric help for what she believed was his lack of sexual drive. She couldn't be mm. more wrong, right? Yeah, I mean... It's got like a sexual deviance thing going on here, so... A little, yeah, I could see that. In July 19th, 1984, Anna Lemesheva, who is 19, a sex worker, he stabbed her and cut out her uterus and threw it in nearby bushes. Um, before I go too far here, there were a few... And I kind of left it out because it's stupid as shit. Uh, he slashed the eyes of a few of his early victims because there was like this Russian superstition, like, think Wild Wild West. 
Yeah. They thought that the, la- the, last, the last thing, thing they, saw they saw would saw be was burned into their eyes. So he would mutilate the eyes or remove the eyes, and which kind of helped him in a way because he they he realized that was bullshit and stopped doing it. So his mo changes. Yeah, Part that throws through. everything throws them all for a loop. Now they're looking for two guys. Right. So I I and we're still at a point too where in Russia at this time. There are no serial killers. So, I mean, we're talking, he's 11 years into a rampage, and it's, it's very similar MO. So, we, maybe we're talking one, maybe we're talking two, but either way, there's two very, at least very, one or two very distinct killers happening in Russia, but there had been no Russian serial killers. They thought it was, a, you know, a disease of the West, and it wasn't, it wasn't them. They weren't, they didn't have serial killers. So, um,. <laughs> Yeah. Wrong. Right, right. In August of 84, uh, Chikatilo becomes head of the department at plant making heavy industrial machinery. So he's now working in a heavy industrial machinery plant. Uh, the next day, August 2nd, 1984, he congratulates himself by killing 16 year old Natasha Golosovskaya. Uh, Chikatilo murdered her by throwing himself on her, ripping off her clothes, and cutting her with a knife. Now, another thing is, at this point, he's become so skilled with the knife plunging that he knows which way the blood is going to spurt. I guess when you've done it enough. Right. So he's, like, stabbing his victims and just, like, getting out of the way so the blood's not covering him completely. So it's spurting out, and he's getting to see it, and he's getting his arousal from it, and he's getting everything he needs without ever getting it. He's become just very... He's he's become a pro. That's... That's terrifying. It's terrifying that somebody's that motivated to be good at something like that. Like you said, uh, you do a lot of crazy things for sex. Yeah, apparently. So three days later, on August 5th, 1984, Lyuda Alexeyeva, who was 17, murdered in a particularly grisly way. He planted the knife at points in her body where it would not kill her so he could see her suffer, but she eventually died. So he's starting to like... Find no neat little creative ways to just make them suffer even more than they already have to. So once she dies, he just covers her body in a little bit of dirt and left. Um, August 8th through the 15th of 84, two women are murdered. The first was never identified and her head was never found. The second was Akmaral Sidi Oliva, who was 12. She had run away from home and was stabbed to death. On August 18, 1984, Sasa Chepel, who was 11, was found so badly mutilated, mutilated that his father passed out when he saw his son. Sasha's eyes had been gouged out. So we're actually still at a point where maybe he's still gouging them out. I can't remember if that's one or this was an anomaly where maybe he just decided to do it again. I was going to say that might, that sounds like instead of destroying the eyes, that sounds like that was more just like a, like a snap decision where he was like, mm, no, just go for it. Yeah. So the next month, we move from August 18th to September of 84. Uh, on September 6th, uh, Irina Lushinaiskaya, who was 24, uh, he punched her hard and drew his knife from the bag and stabbed her to death. So he was carrying around, uh, much like Dennis Rader, like a kill kit. He had a bag there that contained a knife, some rope. Um, I think it was like a Vaseline, they said. Um that's upsetting. <sighs> yeah, so he was just carrying around a knife that really helped him get through the things he needed to do. Uh, on September 8th, two days later, Sveta Sana, who was 22, was found murdered in Aviators Park by being brutally stabbed. So he loves Aviators Park, as it turns out. On October 8th of 84, uh, Yuri Velikanov, the head of the criminal department of the Russian Public Prosecutor's Office, signed the necessary order to link all of the cases and dropped murder charges against the existing suspects. Huh. So they finally are saying, all right, fuck. Yeah. It's a serial killer. These guys that we suspected are doing it, they're, it's not them. We're, we're blowing it. They're not suspects anymore. So it's that's one just, guy. I mean, it's all out there, and they're like, okay, we got to do something. Right. How do we backtrack? Right, so they're linking it. Um, yeah. Uh, so one of the things they did was they went to uh, apologize essentially to could because two people were executed. Um, and the second guy that was executed, the man who was mentally ill, they, so they go and they tell, you know, we like, we're really sorry about how we falsely, 
um, essentially executed your son. And this is, I think, we're 12, 14 years later. Yeah. And the woman started breaking down. They didn't understand why. And it was because at this point, she hadn't talked to her son for 20 years. And uh, she didn't know that he had been executed. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. So they went to so apologize. So not only does she find out that he's dead, she finds out, oh, oops, finger slipped. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's, that's so weak. There's that. So we move from October to December of the very same year. Um, on December 13th of 84, Chikatilo was observed by an undercover detective attempting to lure young women away from the Rostov bus station. So again, back to the public transportation, the bus, the train, uh, this becomes his, this is his thing. They understand there's a killer. They understand he, he is working on the train stations, the bus stations. This is where they're finding the bodies. They start putting officers undercover, uh, plain clothes officers, regular officers. They are flooding the, the stations at this point. So, um, he was arrested and held. A search of his belongings revealed a knife and a rope and the Vaseline. He was also discovered to be under investigation for minor theft at one of his former employees. We had talked about that, which gave the investigators the legal right to hold him for a prolonged period of time. Chikatilo's dubious background was uncovered, and his physical description matched the description of the man seen with Dmitry Patanishkov uh, in March prior to the boy's murder. A sample of Chikatilo's blood was taken, um, the results of which revealed his Okay, so check this out before I go too far into this. So they have semen. There's been semen at the scenes. He's left it behind. Right. So they take his blood sample, and it doesn't match up to the DNA profile of, of the semen. So um, they they have to let him go. It doesn't match up. But what they don't yeah. know is that his blood type is type A, whereas semen samples found upon a total of six of the victims were type AB. Um it's like a one in 1.5 million anomaly that you would have the two different, uh, a different blood type than a, than a different semen type. So this clears him. Uh, his huh. name is added to the card index file used by ind- investigators. Essentially, he's part of the list now. He, you're, you may have been cleared by that, but we're we're fucking watching you. Yeah, you're not going far. Yeah, exactly. But he's he's cleared at this point. His his blood doesn't match the semen that they found at the scene. Um. Uh, let's see. The index file that they put together for this thing was um. It was filled with suspects and people of interest, and it was over twenty five thousand individuals who had been investigated in connection with the murders. Handwritten too, from what I understand. So this Jesus. this huge f- like card system they had covered 25,000 individuals who had been investigated. Like a fucking um, Dewey Decimal system of murders. Right. So finally Chikatilo was found guilty of the theft of property from his previous employer and sentenced to one year in prison. But he was freed on December 12th, 1984 after serving just three months. On October 8th of 84, the head of oh yeah, we kind of already did that. They link the murders and they actually bring in a psychological profiler for the first time in Russian history to see if they can't build a profile. And I read a thing saying that the profiler had, you know, they have to comb over every piece of information of the case. And that 25,000 individual investigation, it took them eight months to build the profile, but they, for all intents and purposes, pretty much nailed it. Um, they said that it it would be a man who was likely impotent, who had military service, who, I mean, they, he, well, I don't know if it was a they, it was a one man nailed it. So they've linked right. the crimes. They have a psychological profiler. Um, in early of 85, Natalia Poklistova, who was 18, and she is a mentally challenged girl as well. Uh, she was also homeless. Chikatilo stabbed her 38 times before strangling her to death. In August of 85, Irina Gulieva, who is 18, who is also mentally handicapped. It seems like, look, he's 49 now. He's he's kind of seven years into the streak. He looks like he's doing very, um, it's like a lion. He's now, instead of going for the opulent and the, yes, like the, what he, what he really desires, he's like, I have to go after the weak. That's what it okay, seems so like to me. Picking off the limpy gazelles now. Yeah, I mean, I mean kind of a, 
it's a rough way to put it, but but that I mean that's exactly what I'm talking about though. Like that's that's what he's doing. This is the first time it even mentions any of his victims being mentally handicapped. It seems like to me that he needs it to be easier at this point. So yeah. uh, in August. Uh, He does that. He killed her and left her naked um, about 500 yards from the bus stop where he found her. What is, what is happening in? Yeah. In Russia. It seems like he's, he's, well, it seems like he's getting more and more sloppy too. Oh, for sure. And he takes actually a little bit of a cooling off period here, but I don't think it's by choice. So we're going to skip from August of 85 all the way to July of 87. He's now 51 years old and 12-year-old Ivan Bailovetsky, who was a, quote, smart, outgoing little boy with a bright future. Uh, he was found mutilated with his stomach ripped open. Uh, he, he was eviscerated. He, he right. disemboweled him. And his mouth was found uh, stuffed with mud so far it was like filling his throat and they assumed that Chikatilo had just done that to keep him quiet while he was doing with him what he pleased. Yeah. Uh, April 6th of 88. We're looking at a 52 year old Andre Chikatilo. Police found the body of an unknown woman who appeared to have been slaughtered two to five days earlier. May 14th of 88. Um, a small child who was nine years old was found cut up and stabbed to death. July 14th, Zenya Muratov was 15, found brutally stabbed and left under a pile of leaves. January 11th, 1989, Tatiana Ryzova, um, he, Chikatilo, took her to his daughter's house that she no longer lived in and pushed her down on the floor and tried to have sex there. She began mocking him for not being able to get an erection, so he pulled out a folding knife and stabbed her in the mouth. After... Uh, she had died. He cut off her head and legs and cut her into pieces and carried her on a sled to some nearby woods where he would just leave her. Wow. May 11th of 89, four months later, Sasha Dainat- Dainakanov was murdered the day after his uh, eighth birthday. So, sorry, Sasha. He was stabbed to death and left in some bushes 20 yards from the road where he had been picked up. The summer of 89, Chikatilo killed four more times, uh, three of which were little boys. Um, Lyosha Moiseyevev uh, was murdered by Chikatilo and not found for 66 days. Uh, Yelena Varga was found murdered in some abandoned woods in August of 89. Uh, August 29th, 89, uh, Alyosha Kabatov, who is 10, um, was hit over the head by Chikatilo, and Chikatilo then bit off his tongue and cut off his uh, penis and testicles. Uh, he threw his body um, and just covered it up with a little dirt. So, I mean, <clears throat> not to sound like I'm giving tips to killers, but... I, don't you have to tr- you're doing all of this i mean i guess it's the process for him so maybe at that at the end whatever mental state he's in doesn't even recognize them <laughs> as human and that's part of it like i'm not burying this but i don't i don't know i'm i'm a little miffed by the fact that he ne- at no point really tries to cover his tracks he yeah, puts a little dirt on him or throws some leaves on him <clears throat> there's no effort to cover his tracks because there's no technology that he has to worry about or that he knows about that he has to worry about. It might be true. So, I mean, he got, he got lucky with the DNA thing. And so, you know, fuck it. Why, why even bother? That's like hard fucking evidence right there. And it feels like something that we talk about a lot too, is that a lot of killers get away with a lot of shit. He's been getting, he's been killing for 16 years now he probably feels invincible at this point. Yeah. Um, so skip from August of 89 to January of 1990. Sasa Kravichenko, who was 11, was found stabbed to death and his genitals were cut off. Uh, March of 1990, Yaroslav Marakev was 10. Chikatilo jumped on the boy and began to assault him by an attempt to have oral sex with the boy. It ended 
in hacking and stabbing, and Chikatilo cut off the tip of the boy's tongue and genitals. Both were tossed into the gardens. Jesus. April 4th, 1990, Lobyev Zoyeva, a mentally handicapped woman whom Chikatilo had met on the train, was murdered in the woods, and she was not found until her body was almost completely decomposed. In July of 1993, three months later, a now 54-year-old Andrei Chikatilo uh, kills 13-year-old Vitya Petrov, um, just got him out to a deserted spot and stabbed him multiple times. Uh, August 14th, 1990, 11-year-old Ivan Foreman was found slaughtered on a river beach. He had 45 different knife wounds. In October 17th, 1990, just over two months later, Vadim Gromov, who was 16 and mentally handicapped from birth, uh, was persuaded to follow Chikatilo into the woods when Chikatilo pinned him down and began to sexually molest him. The wounds upon Gromov's body immediately linked his murder to the manhunt. The youth had been strangled, stabbed 27 times, and castrated with the tip of his tongue severed and his left eye stabbed. The discovery of more victims sparked a massive police operation, and because several victims had been found at stations on one rail route through the Rostov Oblast, Viktor Burikov, the lead investigator, had suggested a plan to saturate all larger stations in the Rostov Oblast with an obvious uniform police presence which the killer could not fail to notice. The intention was to discourage the killer from attempting to strike at any of these locations and to have the undercover agents patrol smaller and less busy stations where the murderer's activities would be more likely to be noticed. Pretty ingenious idea. Fill up the big stations with uniformed officers. So he thinks that's where they're at. And he goes to these tinier little stations where there's no cops. But really, they have undercover cops who can watch his actions with a lot less people around. Absolutely. Um I just can't believe this guy just keeps going. It's I just, just like, it's so, so much. It just, I just can't believe it keeps going. It's incredible. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what do you say we take one more little break here, come back and finish off with the story? Okay. All right. Come back, guys. Hey, guys. If you're ever interested in how you could support the show, we just wanted to let you know that patreon.com slash serial chillers podcast is the way to do it. If you feel like the show deserves anything and any right, if you've ever enjoyed it for even a second, you can give as little as a dollar a month to help the wheels keep on turning. Uh, We really appreciate it, and uh, thanks for the support in advance. Patreon.com slash Serial Chillers Podcast. Thank you. So we're talking a little bit off air here about andre chikatilo and i figured we might as well just hit record again welcome back everybody to the serial chillers podcast episode 21 here with myself and new co-host producer greg new full-time co-host producer greg so um we're gonna get right back into goddamn andre chikatilo it is so long it is so brutal you know wesley allen dodd was really hard for me and that's that's because there was so much going on. He only, I mean, I say only, he killed three kids, but there was so much other shit going on. He molested, you know, up to maybe hundreds. It kind of, Andre Chikatilo is just killing all of them as he's going. Yeah. Like he's doing with the Wesley Allen Dodd, but just murdering all of the kids as well. In right. His, in his secret uh, murder shack in Shakti. So, uh, like cool. we said, police are very involved now they get all of the police uh in uniforms out to the big stations so that they can funnel uh chikatilo to the smaller stations where they're going to have plain clothes off officers kind of hoping to uh narrow down who this might be so um the intention of it all was to discourage the killer from attempting to strike at any of these locations and to have undercover agents patrol the smaller less busy stations The plan was approved, and both the uniformed and undercover officers were instructed to question any adult male in the company of a young woman or child and note his name and passport number. So he's he was in charge of doing this. He was in charge of checking people in and out. Who's this? Chikatilo. No, 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 no. Chikatilo is just going to the stations. This is what the leader of the police is saying. Like when you're out there, every man that is with a woman or a little girl, you talk to and you get his name and you get his passport number. So so they're just being extra thorough. Like if anybody looks one 
0.1% fishy, fucking take their name down and talk to them. So, um, police deployed 360 men at all of the stations in the Rostov Oblast, but only un- undercover officers were posted at the three smallest stations on the route through the Oblast, uh, where the killer had struck most frequently. Uh, oh, man. Okay. Kirpichnaya, Donkliskov, and Leostep, in an effort to force the killer to strike at one of these three stations, the operation was implemented on the 27th of October, 1990. Gromov, the boy who had been killed on October 17th, 10 days before the start of the initiative. So th- I think that was the final straw, and here we are. They're, they're fucking going to take this guy down, they think. The same day Gromov's body was found, Chikatilo lured another 16-year-old boy, Viktor Tishtenko, off a train in Kirpishnaya Station, another station under surveillance from undercover police, and killed him in a nearby forest. Tishchenko's body, bearing 40 separate knife wounds, was found on the 3rd of November. November 13th, 1990, um, Chikatilo killed and mutilated a 22-year-old woman named Svetlana Korostik in a woodland near Donkolskov Station. While leaving the crime scene, he was observed by an undercover officer. The policeman observed Chikatilo approach a well and wash his hands and face and brushed off his clothing. He noticed that he had um, soil stains on the elbows and knees of his clothing. Um, He used the well to kind of just clean himself up a little bit. Yeah. Uh, To the officer, he looked very suspicious. The only reason people entered the woodland area near the station at that time of year was to gather wild mushrooms. And the officer noted that he was not in wild mushroom gathering attire, nor was the bag he was carrying suitable for carrying wild mushrooms. So, I mean, I they're super petty and picky reasons probably to be sus- suspicious. But at this point, you know, like I said, we're, any type of suspicion, they're, they're going after that. So um, Chikatilo obviously comes out in more formal attire, like in a suit. Um, he had a, and the, the sports bag was a nylon sports bag. You want to put fucking wild mushrooms in there. Uh, well, the police, you might not want to. I hear it adds to the flavor. <laughs> the policeman stopped Chikatilo and checked his papers, uh, but he had no formal reason to arrest him. I, I mean, doesn't it seem like you hold him and maybe go into the forest from which he came and see if perhaps there's anything back there of any interest. Uh, anyway, they let him go. Uh, the policeman returned to his office. He filed a routine report containing the name of the person that he had stopped at the station. On the 13th of November, Korostik's body was found, and he was the 36th known victim linked to the manhunt. Police summoned the officer in charge of surveillance at the Dunkelskov station and examined the reports of all men stopped in question the previous week. Not only was Chikatilo's name among these reports, but it was familiar to several officers involved in the case because he had been questioned in 1984 and had been placed upon a 1987 suspect list compiled and distributed throughout the Soviet Union. So they had this, so since 1987, they had eyes on him. They had been watching him. Maybe not watching him, but he's definitely been on a list. I don't know, like, that they were, you know, had a guy tailing him or anything, but he has been. At least a person of interest on that. But, I mean, like I said, there's 25,000 people on that list. But he was just somebody who kept coming up. We're talking about now he's coming up three, four, five times. Yeah. Starting to... But every time they narrow the list down, he keeps making the cut. Right. It's like an episode of The Voice or something. So. Um... After checking with Chikatilo's present and previous employers, investigators were able to place him in various towns and cities at times when several victims uh, were linked to the investigation had been killed. Questioning of former colleagues from Chikatilo's teaching days revealed that Chikatilo had been forced to resign from two teaching positions due to repeated complaints of lewd behavior and sexual assault made by his pupils. Police placed Chikatilo under surveillance on November 14th, In several instances, particularly on trains or buses, he was observed approaching lone young women or children and engaging them in conversation. If the woman or child broke off the conversation, Chikatilo would wait a few minutes and then seek another conversation partner. On the 20th of November, after six days of surveillance, Chikatilo left his house with a large jar which he had filled with beer at a small kiosk in a local park before he wandered around Novercherskak, 
What like it's amazing where, that they have beer kiosks in parks. Yeah, and I don't. I guess. I mean, I've taken a. I guess I've taken like a growler to a brewery and gotten it filled up. This seems yeah. like maybe just the Russian equivalent in the Rostov in 1990. Could be. Could be. I just like the term jar of beer. Yeah, I I do. I picture a mason jar with a lid. That's exactly what I was going to say. He's got just like a fucking 62-ounce mason jar, just swamp full of just yellow, pissy Russian beer. The handle on it looks like sun tea. Gross, gross, gross. So he's got his beer. He's walking around a local park, attempting to make contact with the children he met on his way. Upon exiting a cafe, Chikatilo was arrested by four plain co- clothes police officers. On November 29th, 1990, Chikatilo admitted for the first time to authorities that he had killed. So, he, he... They know it's him. They watch him trying to make contact with a bunch of little kids. They bring him in, and apparently they just, like, interrogated him for, like, 12 hours. And he finally was like, listen, fuck, I can't do <laughs> it anymore. Yeah, I fucking did it. So, um... Chikatilo described the various methods he had used to pick up his victims. Um, in the biography documentary that I watched, he was very, very thorough. Like, it showed him on the ground, on top of the dummies, with a fake knife, showing how he would be on them. Like, he was kind of humping the leg a little, stabbing at the, yeah. at the thing, tying the... He was very open, like most serial killers are, I suppose, when they get into this position. The only thing is, is unlike Henry Lee Lucas, where he was just kind of, you know, admitting to what he could admit to to get as many cartons of cigarettes as possible. Chikatilo is connected to these. These these yeah. are his. These are truly and outright his murder. So that's November 29th when he finally admits. January 18th, Chikatilo is described. <clears throat> oh, sorry, that's when he describes the various methods in January. The summer of 91, investigators had almost completed their case against Chikatilo. They believed that they had a clear and conclusive case of 53 killings. Jesus. August 1991, a now 55-year-old Andre Chikatilo. <clears throat> Uh, after police had completed their interrogation, including reenactments of the murders of each crime scene, Chikatilo was transferred to the Serbsky Institute in Moscow to undergo a 60-day psychiatric evaluation to determine whether he was mentally competent to stand trial. Chikatilo was analyzed by senior psychiatrist Dr. Andrei Trachenko. Trachenko did note Chikatilo suffered from various physiological problems which he attributed to prenatal brain damage. So that's that hydrocephalus that we talked about at the very beginning. Right, so he was born with head trauma. He didn't have to wait for it, but right. it happened anyway just in case. Precisely. Uh, he conducted or concluded on October 18th that although suffering from borderline personality disorder with sadistic features, he was indeed fit to stand trial. In December of 1991, details of Chikatilo's arrest and brief summary of his crimes were released to the newly liberated Russian media by police. In April of 92, a 56-year-old Andrei Chikatilo's trial begins. Uh, It took nine hours over two court days just to read the charges filed against him. Jesus Christ. Yeah, so the judge read for five hours the first day, four hours the second day, adjourned, and then they started the trial on the third day. That's insane. Couldn't they just be like, do you want to hear them all? I think, yeah, I mean, I guess they have to. Uh, The trial is described like a circus. Uh, Chikatilo was kept in a cage to protect him from the parents of the victims. Legit, it looks like a cage at a zoo. He's in a cage with bars, sitting up like, it, you know, it's not quite like a an American courtroom because there it's not quite the same. There's no jury. I believe it's a judge, and there are maybe I think it's two citizens that sit with the judge. Yeah. And so he's sitting like, effectively where the witness stand would be in a giant cage. <laughs> so. Like they do on The Simpsons. Right, right, but very real. Like they may have got that from Chikatilo's trial. Uh. Because now that I'm thinking of it, they look very, very similar. Um, 
Many people were escorted from the courtroom as they could not keep it together. And his presence, I mean, the video that you see, you see like adorable little babushka wearing Russian women just like screaming and falling over in the courtroom. Um, it's it's really heavy. They're seeing, you know, the monster that took somebody from them. And it's, uh, I don't know, it's a little sobering, I guess. So um, during the trial, there are times where Chikatilo would just like yell at the judge and the galley at one point, And this is on video. I totally, I don't know that I'll post the video, but uh, he stands up. He whips his tiny little wiener out, shakes it to the judge, and in Russian yells, what am I going to do with this thing? Uh-huh. Like that was essentially part of his defense. So nothing. Uh, w- witnesses claim that it looked like he was overacting and attempting to look insane after being deemed uh, sane, essentially. So uh, October fifteenth, nineteen ninety two, Chikatilo was found guilty of fifty two counts of murder. So one of them he did not be- get found guilty of, but fifty two of the fifty three. Um, this is the day before his his fifty seventh birthday. Well, happy birthday to him. Yes, Valentine's Day, 1994. A 58-year-old Andre Chikatilo is taken to a soundproof cell in the Rostov prison and receives one single bullet behind the right ear. There it is. There it is. So Quick uh, and painless. Yeah, that's that's... I, I, I normally don't bring in pop culture references, but the list was so big, I, I just had to bring it to show you. So, <clears throat> really quickly going to add this. Pop culture references for Andre Chikatilo. <clears throat> there are films. One's called the film Citizen X from 1995. It's directly based upon the murders committed by Chikatilo, inspired by Robert Cullen's nonfiction book, The Killer Department. Uh, the film Evil Inco in 2004 is loosely based, based upon the murders committed. The film Child 44 from 2015 is based on the fiction novel Child 44 by Tom Robb Smith, which was itself inspired by the Andre Chikatilo case. The film was released on April 15th. Uh, Here are factual books about Andre Chikatilo. Um, The four... Oh, okay. So there have been four nonfiction books. Uh, Peter Conradi writes The Red Ripper Inside the Mind of Russia's Most Brutal Serial Killer. Robert Cullen in 1993 wrote The Killer Department, Detective Victor Burikov's eight-year hunt for the most savage serial killer of our times. Uh, a little wordy, Robert, but who am I? Sure. Um, Olgin and Mikhail Krivich write in 1993, Comrade Chikatilo, The Psychopathology of Russia's Notorious Serial Killer. Um, And then Richard Lowry in 1993 also wrote Hunting the Devil, the pursuit, capture, and confession of the most savage serial killer uh, in history. Some fiction books, uh, Child 44, like we talked about before. Also, uh, television, Criminal Russia, The Trail of Satan is a documentary focused on the case. Inside Story, The Russian Cracker, 1999, a BBC documentary focusing on the case. And the one that I watched was The Butcher of Rostov, a 45-minute biography channel documentary focusing upon the murders committed by Andre Chikatilo. So, yes, uh, Burkov, the head investigator, is actually invest- is uh, interviewed in that one. So it's kind of cool. Kind of a fun little, fun little thing there. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's pretty much it, man. Um, Thanks for uh, can, for. Can I say this guy was a sick, 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 sick fuck? Yeah, you can say that. Sick you, fuck. You absolutely can say that. God. So I mean, I mean, I don't. You know me. I'm not easily rattled by stuff. Definitely and very, very rough. A couple of times I wanted to tap. Yeah. Um, I, I did tap. You were there. I told you. I. <laughs> I, I can't do it tonight. Like, I just, yeah. I can't do it tonight. So, yeah. um, I'm going to do a little outro right now, if you don't mind. I'll just n- n- handle it. Yeah. Okay, so uh, thank you guys again for listening. Thank you again, Greg, for coming. I'm sorry I couldn't bring you guys a quiz this week. I hope this doesn't kill it for you guys. This is not how it's going to be every week. We're going to try to have guests on. If we can just get one guest, Greg will always be the second contestant on the show. So, uh, we have Greg for that now. So, uh, I guess congrats, Greg, on your on your win. 
<laughs> so promotion? yeah hey greg you uh you get promoted and you know what you get the same thing you always get so if you guys want to correct anything that we maybe got wrong tonight or completely missed you can do it in many different ways facebook is at serial chillers podcast the instagram is at serial chillers podcast twitter is at chillers podcast the email is serialchillerspodcast at gmail.com. We have the voicemail line still. That is 1-805-666-2513. Remember, the show is now on YouTube again. And uh, the website is getting updated. We're actually going to move over carriers and possibly have some merch very soon. I'm not sure if that's anything that interests you guys, but I'm going to spend some money anyway and just get it out there in case you want to get some. So... Um, Patreon is the last thing. Uh, again, I want to thank Kevin and Chris for being two new donors this month. Uh, Patreon.com slash Serial Chillers Podcast is the, at the current moment, best possible way you can support the show. You can give as little as a dollar a month for one month. Anything you do is, is okay by me. Thank you guys. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll put some notes in the footer of the Uh, outro here for you guys to check out all of the research sources since we're not going to do a traditional outro this week and i'll also get that up on the website uh thank you again greg episode 21 of the serial chillers podcast is in the books see you later brother peace And I know I said I wasn't going to do an outro, but I would feel absolutely awful if I didn't just go ahead and get the people who actually did the heavy research for this out of the way. So I just want to thank again the Radford University for providing these amazing timelines of all of these killers and serial killers. This particular one was researched and summarized by Christina Goss, Alyssa Gray, and Joshua Villalazzo. Also, watched the biography documentary like I talked about in the episode and the last podcast on the left episodes 141 and 142 of the Andre Chikatilo story those guys put so much research into that show it's it's absolutely incredible so I just I, I'd be remiss if I didn't go ahead and get all of those research sources out there uh, obviously the Wikipedia was in there as well and All intro and outro music was made by new full-time co-host, Greg. So you can check Greg out on soundcloud.com slash Greg. Thank you again, everybody, for listening to episode 21.